Today, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Zoltan, Zoltan Bidnyansky from Budapest. Zoltan uh, did his PhD with uh, Martin Elekesh in, uh, in Budapest and then did uh, several uh, postdocs, uh, went in Vienna, went to Caltech, and, uh, and now he's uh, back to Budapest and he's going to talk today about homomorphisms in the choiceless worlds. Uh, Zoltan, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation and and, uh, um, and I'm, I'm very happy to talk here. So first of all, I'm, I'm not sure if, okay, so if I do this, uh, can you can you see my slides also or, or now my slides disappear? Uh, no, you, you, your slides are still there. So... Okay, perfect, perfect. So, okay, so one thing which I wanted to start with, so feel free to interrupt me at any point, okay, so I... If, if anything is unclear, just, just ask questions. All right. So, all right. So let me, let me start, I guess, with, with some uh, naive philosophical question, which, which, uh, which I, I, maybe doesn't make sense at all. But OK, so, so for example, you, we take uh, a graph, a finite graph, and we have this experience that deciding two coloring is is very easy whether there is a two coloring or not and deciding three coloring is very complicated which is seems to be uh, seems to be the case and the, the naive philosophical question is which you might have a better answer than i do uh, so what is the corresponding statement to this in the infinite world is, is there an infinite Maybe people from who, who are more familiar than with large cardinals or cardinal arithmetics then I am, can they have a better answer to this if you set up the cardinals in the right way? So, um, so what I, anyway, so, so I, you, you're very welcome to answer to these questions. What I, first of all, what I want to say here is that the last couple of years, and especially the last year, first I started to convince myself that the Borel version could be a nice playground, a nice answer to this general question. But now, I, it, it took me a long time, but now I convinced myself that it is not. So, uh, Borel is not very good. So, I, I will, uh, on the other hand, I will present something, some very nice experience uh, with, with, uh, with a way in which some sort of answer to this question can, can, uh, can be. Um, there is a price to pay, however. I know that people don't like dropping the axiom of choice but i will make some uh, some argument that in this case it's it's very necessary or, or it's somewhat necessary and also i hope to convey you that the, this very pleasant thing that somehow we started to work with something and then suddenly this place the pieces of puzzle fit together very nicely and then this at least to some extent convinces me that these are not accidental connections, but really, really, maybe there are some deeper connections. So I will start with this finite thing. So I, I will set up the context from this um, finite computational complexity and I will, I will introduce everything hopefully. And, uh, but also feel free to ask questions uh, and then I will switch to the infinite. Okay, so yeah, so so what are what are these homomorphism problems in the finite world? Uh -huh. Yes, so so that I will consider something which is called the CSP dichotomy, which is CSP stands for constraint satisfaction problem. But this is going to be our 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 uh, world. Uh, so we fix some. Yeah, so so the first part of the talk is about finite structures. Everything is finite. Okay, and then. Um, and uh, for example, we have a finite structure H, a relational structure with finitely many relations. And the people, the thing which uh, computer, uh, computer scientists consider this is this question that given a structure G with the same language, with the same relations, is there a homomorphism to H? Okay, sorry. So is there a homomorphism to H? Homomorphism meaning here that you have to preserve relations. So related point 
points map to related points. And, and you sort of should think about it as H being fixed, finite, small structure, and G is, is what the enemy gives you, and you have to decide this problem. Okay, and some examples. Uh, graph and coloring. This is the, the most basic example. So if, if, you, if you take H to be Kn, the complete graph on N vertices, then a homomorphism from a graph to Kn. So maybe I just write here complete, complete graph on N vertices. And I, uh, yeah, so I, I will assume that it's defined on, on the set zero and minus one. These are going to be the vertices just, just, just for, for some later considerations. So anyways, graph and coloring is the simplest example of this. What about uh, more general questions? Well, we can, if, if we have a graph H, we can also consider graph H colorings, which, uh, which are also examples, of course, uh, which, which means that you have, you want to only find a homomorphism to your graph. Okay. Some more interesting example is the systems of linear equations over some finite field. And I will use this notation 3 lin 2 for that. There is a concrete way of, of encoding this. This is not super important, but you should believe me that any system of linear equations which you come up with, I can come up with a, a, a structure such that a solution to a system of linear equations is going to be a, exactly a homomorphism to some fixed structure. Say for F2, we have a structure in 0, 1 and some relations. So again, it's very natural and not, not super, super uh, important. Uh, and uh, yeah, so for historical reasons, I put here NSAT, Hornsat, all these, all these computer science problems are, are instances of, of this homomorphism problem. And uh, yeah, so, so people care about it, its complexity. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so it's easy to see that all these problems are in NP, right? So if, if I get, there is a fixed structure and then somebody gives you another structure G and you want to decide whether there is a homomorphism, then if they give you a, a witness to the homomorphism, then it's easy to check. It's polynomial time to check. So these problems are, are in NP, right? But it turns out, and this was the first result in, in, compu in computer science, really, that that uh, sometimes they are easy and sometimes they are very hard. So two set is uh, polynomial time solvable and n set if n is at least three is np hard. So is it as complicated in the np world as it gets? Similarly for two coloring. So uh, so two coloring is easy to decide. Three coloring is is very hard. Is very hard to decide. Now, there is this result of Helen Nash at Rio where, where this whole thing gets, gets, I think, very interesting. So you can ask about graph homomorphism. So in the beginning, I, this, is, this is graph homomorphism. So I give you a graph H, and the enemy gives us a graph G, and you want to decide whether there is a homomorphism from G to H. And it turns out that it's easy to do this if H is bipartite. It's polynomial time solvable. And this is actually easy. And, uh, and while if, if H is non-bipartite, if it contains an odd cycle, this is as hard as it gets. Okay? And this was the, the contribution of Helen Nashatril. They proved that, that uh, this, this problem, I mean, this, this right-hand side statement, that this problem is, is NP-hard. Okay? And what about linear equations? So is this is real in P. Well, linear equations are, are quickly solvable with Gaussian elimination, right? Okay. So, yeah, so, so we see that there is this sort of clear split, at least in these in instances, and uh, Feder and Vardy also saw this, and they, they, um, and they conjectured the following, that if I, if we take any homomorphism problem, it's either polynomial time solvable or, or it's empty hard. It was in mid 90s, 90s uh, where this conjecture came up. And uh, yeah, so actually I have to mention this, that this is already an informative so conjecture. So, so if you only prove this so without so anything that is already says, says something because Ledner proved 
uh, Lebner constructed problems which are obviously not homomorphism problems, which are intermediate. So they are they are not if p is not np. So they are not not uh, easy and not super hard uh, either. Okay. So there are problems like that, and Federwardi conjectured that that this there are no such examples in the case of homomorphism problems with in which uh, with which we are dealing with. Okay. But okay. But if we go back just here, we see this Hellnesch real statement, and there is a very very nice uh, understanding of of what is which are the hard problems and which are the easy problems here. So there is clear, a clear and easy characterization of those graphs for which, for which the homomorphism problem is polynomial time solvable and those for which it's, it's very hard. Okay. Um, right. So maybe there is a characterization here as well. And it, indeed, there is a characterization and this was breakthrough result of Bulat of Jevons and Horokin, where they came up with a property, with an algebraic property, which characterizes the graphs for which this homomorphism problem is, or they conjecture that this characterizes the graph for which, uh, for which the homomorphism problem is complicated. So I will denote this property by star, and I will define this property soon, but, but just, just to state the main result, I, I will use this shorthand. And uh, so there is an algebraic property of the target graph, of, of the target structure H, such that if this algebraic property doesn't hold, then the, for H, then the homomorphism problem is complicated. This is what they proved, okay? And in fact, what happens in this situation is that if this property, this algebraic property doesn't hold for H, uh, then it can encode any other structure in a very concrete way. This this was uh, this was um, the main result of Bulat of Jevons and Krokin in this paper, and and this sort of made algebra out of this computational complexity world because now we have this algebraic property and we only have to investigate structures which have this algebraic. And yes, and now the conjecture after this became that if star holds, then H is in P, okay? And finally, yes, uh, so finally, let, let me define what is, what is uh, um, yeah, before stating, I, I wanted to say that this conjecture has been verified, but I will state it after defining the property star. And uh, yeah, so what is this? algebraic uh, condition star. So um, for this, we need this crucial notion, which is called polymorphism. And people from which I talked in computational complexity, they said that this really re revolutionized this field of homomorphism problems. So this, this is a thing to remember, I think. And, and it's also a very easy concept. So what is a polymorphism? A polymorphism is a homomorphism from a power of the structure H to, to H. Okay, so what is this power? Okay, I mean, this better if, so this, for homomorphisms to make sense, you better, there are relations on this H to the N. And this is what sometimes people call categorical power. But this is a um, very simple thing. So if we have vectors here, say there is a binary relation over there, and binary relation, then in the new structure, the power structure, two vectors, so uh, are, uh, say, whatever, B and W are related, if and only if, so this is an H to the N, if for each I, uh, the coordinates are related, okay, in H, okay. So this is <clears throat> this is uh, this this is the definition of of this power structure, and uh, and um, now we want to we want to have a polymorph a polymorphism is nothing else but a homomorphism from this structure to to, to this 
is the original one. Okay, so like this. Okay, and now uh, if if I was if if I were to give uh, um, a normal talk, uh, then then I could ask something like, okay, so come up with a polymorphism. So I can ask this uh, here as well. If you haven't seen this before, this is uh, a good a good test question and good sanity check question. Well, the easiest polymorphism is just a projection, right? If I have, I have to check for homomorphism. So if I have several vectors, uh, if if they are related, then this means that they are related in every coordinate. In particular, if I project to one coordinate, then those things have to be related as well. So projections are always polymorphisms. And uh, yeah, what about more interesting polymorphisms? Um, and my claim is that K2, uh, the graph K2 is just uh, the complete graph on two vertices. So this is K2. Uh, it has a sort of substantially or, or um, essentially non-trivial non polymorphism. Okay. In fact, I, I will construct such a polymorphism for, from K2 to, to the power of 3 to K2. Okay. And this polymorphism is going to be the majority map. Okay, so let, let's just quickly check. So what is the majority map? So the elements here are vectors and each entry is either zero or one. Okay, this is an element over here and this is mapped to zero because there are two zeros. Okay, so I take the majority of the coordinates. It's, it's a, it's a uh, <clears throat> fair voting system. And um, and um, yeah, so, so just to check that this is a homomorphism, we have to check that if two vectors here are connected, then the image is connected over there. Well, how can two vectors here be connected? Well, two vectors are connected if they are connected in every coordinate. So this means that, say, for example, this vector 0, 1, 0 is connected to only to uh, 1, 0, 1. So this is the only connection, but this, of course, maps to zero. This, of course, maps to one. And these are all connected, so we're happy. So yeah, so majority map is, is a polymorphism of K2. And this is also, this is clearly non-projective. Non so this, um, as non-projective as it gets. And uh, yeah, so let me also, let me also, um, talk a, a bit about the intuition for polymorphisms or, or a bit different intuition. And this is, this is something uh, very important, um, I, I think, and, and it is a better way of looking at them. So think about the structure G. So here I have a structure and I have H. And assume that I have several homomorphisms from G to H. Looks something like this. And then if I have homomorphisms, then this gives, gives me a homomorphism from G to H to the power of three, which is just putting ne next to each other uh, the coordinates, okay? And then if I have a non-trivial polymorphism, I can compose these two, and suddenly I get a new homomorphism from G to H. So here it's written as follows. Polymorphisms are a way to combine homomorphisms to a new one. And projections are a trivial way of just picking one. So I, 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 maybe I, I, I will say it as follows. If I have several solutions to have a homomorphism problem and I have a polymorphism, then I necessarily have a new polymorphism. Okay. And the previous example if I just translate the previous example to this language, it says that if I have a graph and I have two coloring, I have several, three, two colorings of the graph and I take the majority at every vertex, then uh, this is going to be also a two coloring. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, so let me show another example of a polymorphism just to, uh -huh. so yeah, so, so some people say that, that, uh, that, uh, polymorphism and existence of a polymorphism is something like that H has a, a, a non-trivial higher dimensional symmetry. So this is like the, the 
A polymorphism is really a, some sort of higher dimensional symmetry. Sorry, Zoltan? Yes. Yeah, um, I was wondering about this majority, uh, this majority polymorphism. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, is it working only with three or? Cause, cause yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's working if in any odd. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. So, so this is a good question. So it's, uh, it works in every odd, odd uh, dimension. In every odd dimension, and, and you really need odd, right? Because then, then the voting makes sense because there are zeros and ones, and if the dimension is odd, then, then it's... okay. But it, it it doesn't create confusion. The fact that like uh, you have like here the the only way to be in majority is like you have two zeros and one one, and so yeah. All right. Okay. I, okay. I'll have to think about it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. No problem. Thanks for the question. So, yeah, yeah, so, but I, I will present you another example of polymorphism, but now in this new language, that polymorphisms are a way of, of, uh, of uh, combining solutions to new one. So, okay, remember what was this? This is a system of linear equations over F2, over, over the, the finite field F2. And, uh, okay, so here I have a system of linear equations, AX equals to B, and question how can I, I somebody solves it and how can there are some uh, several solutions how can i get a new solution and the trick here is that so if say x1 equals to b and ax2 equals to b and ax3 equals to b then if i take x to be the sum of these x1 and x2 and x3 then of course that is also going to be equal to b. Why? Because fortunately we are over the finite field three. Okay, linearity works here. So these are three b's, but that is of course just b. Okay. So this is also so this addition is a non-trivial way of getting new solutions from old solutions, and uh, three lin two is is. Um, as I also has a, a non-trivial polymorphism. Okay. And okay, a non-example. K3 is a non-example. So we have seen the two coloring to uh, yeah, so has this is a typo, has no non-trivial polymorphisms. Uh, so um, okay, so what do I mean by it? Formally, I mean by the following. If I if I'm given a a polymorphism from K3 to the end to K3, then it, it must depend only on one coordinate. Okay, this is the claim which I'm making, and this, this sort of says that it, everything is essentially a polymorph, uh, a projection. Okay, and with re-enumerating, okay, K3 is again the, the K3 is the triangle, okay, so it looks something like this. Okay. Sorry for the ugly picture, isn't it? And uh, yeah, so so with re-enumerating the, the vertices, actually you can assume that that uh, if I substitute here zeros all the way, then then I get a zero, and I, if I substitute here ones, I get a one, etc. And now comes a bit of of set theory or logic, if you wish. So. Um, and actually, I, I recommend this. This is a nice exercise. I recommend it for exercise classes. People, in fact, have different names for it. Um, so, um, and, and maybe maybe they already know that that, uh, that this this proof. So, okay. So let's 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 do the following. Assume that we have a non-trivial polymorphism, and I will define a collection of subsets of n. Okay, so n is here the dimension. And I say that A is an element of this U. If no matter how I take a, a, a vector, or, or in other words, it, here is the set A, and uh, I, I say that Sorry. A is in this. Sorry, Zoltan. I'm, I'm, uh -huh. I'm not, uh, do you mean phi of x, x, x is different from x, or? No, no, actually, I mean that, that, uh, that on constant sequences, it spits out the same. Okay, okay, right, thanks. So, so I mean, um, yeah, so, so these are vectors here, 
and, I, and these are vectors of, of entries zero, one, or two, right? And then if they, if they say the constant zero maps, map to z one, then I just rename in the target one by zero, et cetera. I just permute the, the not labels on the target. And then I can assume that, that this is this holds. Okay. Because that doesn't change the, the adjacency relation. So if you, anyway, so, so this, but this is not very important. I mean, assume that this looks like this and, uh, the, the polymorphism have, have, has this property. The important thing, which, which comes now that I can define this family of sets as follows. Uh, I say that that a family, an element A is in this family U. If I write zeros over here on some vector, then on over A, then it necessarily maps to zero. Okay. So in particular, I know that if I write zero everywhere, then of course it maps to zero by this assumption. So the whole set is definitely in U. Okay. And now you can guess, or maybe you have already guessed, what, what is U going to be? And also I use this letter, not accidentally. So, well, the, the claim is that U is an outer filter. This is this is a nice exercise. Let me just illustrate how to prove, for example. Uh, so I claim that you is an ultra filter, and okay. So this means that once in, in a set on a set which is U, I write zeros, then 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 it must be mapped to zero. But then it means that uh, okay. So ultra filter. This is a fancy word, but we are we are working over a finite set n. So on finite sets, the ultra filters are really, really boring. They mean that they, they depend on a single coordinate. Okay. So an element is in U if and only if it's in, in, in contains this single coordinate. In other words, this really means that this phi must depend on a single coordinate. Okay. So if I manage to prove that U is an ultra filter, I'm okay. And, uh, because finite ultra filters are, are trivial. Uh, trivial, um, yes, I guess that was also uh, correct. Excuse me, Zoltan, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, so the definition of U should really be an implication for every V if a V. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. This should I be an Because we're trying to figure out here in Udine what was going on. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is, this is a typo. Okay. Okay. So anyways, but okay. So another name for this statement is Eros paradox. Really this, you can think about this homomorph, this polymorphism as voting systems as before, and then there is a vector and you have to vote and you have to have a an outcome. And, and then this is actually a weaker version of Eros paradox that, that, um, that this is going to be, a, um, whatever it is, dictatorship necessarily, because there is one, a single voter which decides about everything. And uh, yeah, so, so for example, okay, so just, just an illustration how these proofs work. So for example, if I have A and A complement and uh, I write here zero and I write here one and I write here one and write, write here two and I write here uh, two and write here zero, then, okay, so just notice that all these are connected in this power graph, right? So it must be the case that uh, uh, all these three go to different points, right? Because this is a triangle here, homomorphism must preserve this triangle. But this one cannot go to, to the point zero because this is connected with the constant zero sequence. So it must be the case that either this one or this one goes to the point zero, right? So this means that if I write zero over the coordinates corresponding to A, then it goes to zero, or I write here, I write zeros on the co coordinates corresponding to A complement, then, uh, then it goes to zero. And then, okay, so this is a sketch for saying that A or A complement is in U, and similarly, you can show that uh, 
view is closed under intersections. So, so U is indeed an outer filter. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Anyway, so we uh, we have all these examples, and uh, now I can define this algebraic condition. And what is this algebraic condition? Well, um, you can imagine. So people um, came up with this with this single algebraic condition uh, with this conjecture, and then they try to find all these equivalence forms of of this algebraic connection. So there is a huge literature with a lot of forms of of this al algebraic uh, algebraic condition on on the on the structure H. So this this is this this is from the work of of a number of people and uh, yeah so it turns out that for age the following are equivalent there is here this i call there is an essentially non-projective essentially non-projective polymorphism projective polymorphism the polymorphism here it says that there is a polymorphism with this particular form uh, that that if I if I move around this y here, then I get the same result. This also ensures that this is not not uh, not uh, projection. And what's going to be important for us is that there exists a cyclic polymorphism of every prime arity uh, where the prime is large enough. And cyclic means that if I cyclically permute the the entries, then I get the same result. And I will call these conditions stars. So this is this is sort of the dividing line. This these are um, this is the dividing line between hard and easy problems. Uh, or this was conjectured to be the dividing line between hard and easy problems by by uh, Bulatov, Jevons, and Korokhin. And uh, Bulatov and Juk uh, a couple of year, years ago proved the, the the this main result. That this is indeed the situation. If star holds, then the homomorphism problem is, is easy. Okay. So, yeah, so, so in, to sum up an intuition, if H has a non trivial, uh, a non trivial higher dimensional symmetry or, or a, this sort of polymorphism, then it, the problem is easy. If it doesn't, then it's hard. Okay. So, this is what they know. Um, are there any questions up to this point? Because this this is what I wanted to say about the finite statements. Okay, okay. So yes, sorry. So everything you said that if no star holds, then you are in an, you are in the outer, right? Yeah, so so yes, yes. So if so this yeah, I just go back here. Yeah, so this was already proved by Bulatov, Javons, and Korokin that star, if there is no polymorphism, then it's empty hard. So so if uh, so that last theorem is really equivalence. Yeah, I mean yeah, so so this is this is actually a, a, a cheating on their part, which I really don't like, and and you are you are very much right to pointing that out. So the the issue is that p can be n p, right? And so they call it a dichotomy, but in normal people, what I think what people should call a dichotomy is a statement which which are the two cases are exclusive. But in this situation, it could be the case that everything is in p. Right, so then then this means that if star holds, then it's in P, and if it doesn't, then it's still in P. So it's not a very interesting statement in this situation. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yes. Okay. Um, now let me just say a couple of words about the yes about the Borel question, which is which is turned out to be not the right. Uh, infinite array generalization. So sorry, actually, sorry. it was um... Zoltan. Yes. Um, there is a there is a question of Matteo in the in the uh -huh, chat. Uh -huh. In the chat, he asks. He says that Neuchatel Hall uh, had a theorem dividing the homomorphism problem in two classes. How does these two theorem compare? Well, this is much much stronger. 
Yeah, so 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 this is like a, a very strong generalization of Nash at real hall. Uh, so Nash at real hall. Um, but it was only for, I mean, for Nash graphs, no? already already easily follows from Bulatov, Jevons, and Krokin because uh, Bulatov, Jevons, and Krokin says that if if there is no non-trivial polymorphism, then everything can be encoded, and then you can sort of check that if if there is a, a an odd cycle, then then. I mean, it's similar proof to this. Then, then there is no non-trivial polymorphism. And the other other case of the Nash at real hall is uh, hell is is easy because uh, because uh, there what you have is that you want to prove that if the graph is bipartite, then it's easy to decide uh, homomorphisms to the bipartite graph. But bipartite graphs themselves they homomorph to K two. So. So if you homomorph to a bipartite graph, then you are too colorable and uh, if, if and only if for non-empty bipartite graphs. So so this is this is like much much stronger, much much stronger. Yeah, but yeah, I, I should have pointed that out. Okay. Any other questions which I didn't? Okay. So let me go back to the Borel context. So actually, Riley Thornton, uh, Andrew Marx's student, started to work in this generality with the Borel context because before, yeah. So, so what is the just quick? I, I will I will be quick here, and you don't lose anything uh, if if you don't don't understand this. So in in the Borel context, the homomorphism and the graph and the structure required to be Borel, and what we have shown with Stevo that. In, in Borel and coloring is is sigma one too hard, whatever that means. Um, uh, if n is at least three, and it was also known that Borel two coloring is easy. So based on that, I was really hoping that Borel is going to be the right playground for for these infinite versions. But it and also Riley also managed to show that if star doesn't hold, so if the finite problem is hard. Then the Borel H coloring is sigma one too hard. It's actually not very hard. I mean, he had to combine Bulatov, Jevons, and Krokin and, and our result with Stevo, and then 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 he managed to show it. But uh, unfortunately, uh, solving linear equations over Borel uh, Borel linear equations can be complicated. So so this sort of shows that this analogy breaks down. And what if, if you ask me, I can tell more about it. But I, what I want to talk about uh, is is another is another way of approaching it uh, in the infinite. And uh, okay, so going back to this this philosophical question. So so again, I want a statement for, uh, about infinite graphs, which reflects that whenever you want to check the three colorability of the of an infinite graph then you that, that that's a hard task and in fact you have to essentially check all the possible colorings this, this is this is a slight strengthening of what they believe this is the exponential time hypothesis that if you want to three color decide three colorability you have to check all the subsets really and uh, so why is it why does it fail for uh, infinite graphs. So why is why is I mean you should look at graphs on natural numbers, and then you ask this how how to check whether a graph uh, can be three colored. Uh, and unfortunately, we have compactness, right? So in that compactness says that a, a, an infinite graph is is uh, three colorable if and only if it, all its finite subgraphs are three colorable. So you don't have to check all the subsets. You have to check only countably many subsets to, to get three colorability. And somehow, OK, so somehow for this reason, compactness is not very good in this situation. And also if you, OK, so maybe an, another way of trying to, <clears throat> you know, have an ideology for, for, the, for why to consider these things is that, uh, is that we have okay, so this is this is going to be unfortunately this is on YouTube or something, so I cannot say I cannot lie too much. But uh, but anyways, the the point is that before we have seen that three coloring 
is a complicated problem. And three coloring is complicated sort of because there is no non-trivial polymorphism and there is no non-trivial polymorphism because there is no finite, there is no ultra filter, there is no non-trivial ultra filter. So if you want three coloring, but in the infinite case, there is, an in, uh, there is a non-trivial ultra filter, right? So if you want to uh, have three coloring to be complicated, then maybe you have to consider situations in which in which there is no uh, non-trivial ultra filter, whatever that means. And in Borel, in a sense, in the Borel category, there is no non-trivial ultra filter. So that was a good guess, but sort of maybe it's not sensitive enough um, in this situation. And now we consider uh, um, um, the next uh, version. Okay, so this is this is a compactness result. This is a compact st nice statement so, um, for, for parameterized by, by a structure H. So it says that no matter how you take a structure G, if every finite substructure admits a homomorphism to H, then, then, then the whole structure does. Again, this follows from the axiom of choice for each, uh, for, for, for each H. But if you drop the axiom of choice, and this is a word which you want to work uh, you don't want to have, for example, ultra filters, then, then it's a legitimate question to consider this cage is the relationship of these cages to each other. Okay. And this is what we did. And actually, there was a um, significant amount of work uh, done uh, on it before a long time ago. Uh, this is Levi, Michalski, and Loikli from uh, 60s and 70s. They proved that if you look at the compactness for n coloring where n is at least three then it's actually equivalent to to the boolean prime ideal theorem which is which is also equivalent to essentially the ultra filter lemma so there is a very intimate connection between between n three coloring and ultra filters it seems while if you look at uh, the the two coloring version then it doesn't imply this so yeah, so so you have we have already this sort of distinction here. We have had this uh, distinction in the in the ZF world, and uh, now we wanted to understand how do we have sort of uh, an analog of the bullet of Zhu dichotomy. Yes. When you when you consider this K sub H, H should still think that it's always finite. Always finite. Always finite. Why? It also makes sense to consider the infinite ones, uh, but but we didn't uh, didn't think about it. So it's okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. So uh, okay. So this is not the surprising part. Uh, as I said in this bullet of Jevons and Krokin, they have that if star doesn't hold for H, then you can encode any other finite structure in a very constructive way. And we had to check essentially that this works in our context and this does. So it says that, that if H, H has no non-trivial polymorphisms or symmetries, then, uh, then this equivalence holds. So KH is equivalent to, to as, as hard as it gets. The surprising part is that it was really easy to get. I mean, really easy. So once we understood what we have to do, it, it was it was relatively, I mean, a pleasant experience, definitely, to get this result. So that there exists a model of ZF uh, in which in which those ones, those cages fail, uh, for which we don't have star, but those cages where we do have star hold. So cage holds if and only if uh, H has star. Okay, so this is like the main main uh, theorem here. So we have detected the same split in the ZF models relatively easily as they did in the finite world. And um, yes, um, of course, it doesn't say anything about the finite world. So hope, I mean, luckily, so I don't want to claim any 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 strong uh, anything here. It it just says that. There is this equivalence between this algebraic condition and K, K, KH. There is this description uh, over, over uh, uh, ZF. 
Okay, uh, and actually, I want to sketch the proof because because it, I, I think it's really it's really uh, nice, and and maybe some people will have some ideas, or some takeaway ideas from from what happened here. Okay. Um, okay. So so what do we want? What do we want to do? We want to build a model of Z app such that in this model we have. K, K sub H precisely if, if, if there is an non-trivial polymorphism. Okay. ZF models are somewhat hard. So instead of them, we consider uh, ZF A models. And uh, there is some relatively straightforward, uh, uh, or at least definitely not very complicated forcing argument from ZF uh, from how to get from these to these. Okay. Uh, and I don't want to talk about it. However, I do want to talk about ZFA model. So what is ZFA? So um, we had to throw out the axiom of choice, but now you also have to throw out the axiom of, of equality, meaning that, that there will be sets which contain no element, but they are not equal to the empty set. And they, those are called atoms. Okay. And... Uh, and the, the idea is of these ZFA models, which, by the way, I, I was surprised to learn this. They, they predated significantly uh, Cohen's construction of, of, of um, the independence of the axiom of choice. Like, I, I think the first one was probably constructed by Frankel in, in the 20s. But of course, that, those are not ZF, ZF models, really. But using those ideas, Cohen managed to come up with the, with the uh, independence of axiom of choice. Where actually, I mean, in retrospect, it's not very surprising that these atoms, somehow the generic reals, they look like indistinguishable to some extent. And these atoms are also indistinguishable to some extent. So yeah, with a significant amount of hand, hand waving, you can believe that, that this works out. And anyway, so, so what are these ZFA models? So we have these atoms. Maybe I just draw uh, a picture. These are sort of elements which you start with, and uh, they look like the empty set. And then you build the cumulative hierarchy as, as usual. Okay, so, yeah, so you build a word, but on top of these atoms. And, uh, but you don't want to have any subset of atoms in it. You only want to have some symmetric or invariant subsets of those. And what the symmetry here mean will fix a group action and this have, will have to be invariant under that. Okay. So, yes. So, uh, if you, we have a group acting on the atoms, then uh, and then we build the whole universe from atoms, then this group also acts on, on you see who. And then we say that the set is symmetric if there is a if there is a uh, finite. I'm sorry, I just have to plug in my laptop. So if there is a finite set of atoms such that once you stabilize this finite set, then you also stabilize this set. Okay. And these are subgroups, of course, of gamma. So, so this makes sense. And then we take AHS to be the collection of hereditarily symmetric sets. Okay. And it turns out, and this is the theorem, that this HS is a model of ZFA. So the picture really is that there are these atoms. We build the whole universe, but we all also restrict ourselves to, to this hereditarily symmetric sets, and we are still okay with ZFA. And now we want to construct a model in which, in which uh, this hereditarily symmetric model in which, in which what we want happens, namely that K sub H uh, fails for, for those H's where we don't have a polymorphism and uh, it does hold for those for which we have a polymorphism. Okay. So first of all, this is going to be easy and relatively straightforward. So I, I have to come up with a gamma and I have to come up with the set of atoms, and the set of atoms is going to be countable, and I will arrange it, arrange it like this. Okay, for some reason it's like so. So arrange it like this. Uh, so this is a triangle. This is a pentagon, uh, and 
etc. So for each for each uh, prime number, I do a cycle of that length. Okay, hopefully it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ish. Okay, so hopefully. So anyway, so this is C3, C5, C7. And these are going to be the atoms. So these are elements of A. And I have to come up with a group. And the group is going to be generated by cyclically uh, twist, uh, permuting uh, these, these, uh, these cycles. So gamma is going to be the group generated by gamma P, where gamma is a cyclic shift shift of, of C7. Okay, so a very similar model to this was already considered uh, in, in, um, in the case of, of the original results by, um, I think, Levy. And okay, so, so what's, what's the point here? So I have gamma, and I claim that in this situation, in this model, uh, the compactness for three coloring fails. In order to show that the compactness for three coloring fails, I have to come up with a graph which have finitary three colorings, but uh, but not the whole thing cannot be three colored. And look, I already draw the graph. So this is the graph. Uh, this is first of all going to be in the model. It's easy to check that this finitary three colorable, even in the model, and then. If there was some three coloring of the whole graph, okay, maybe I will draw this. This is one color set, okay? Then what what are the elements of this this hereditary symmetric model? So if you look here, we have to have the property that it's, there is a finite set such that if you stabilize that finite set, then you stabilize that x as well. So if if uh, the coloring so if the one color class, say this is, I don't know, X is one color class, so X is one color class, then it must be the case that there is some finite set of atoms, maybe those, such that if, if I stabilize those ones, then I, I general I stabilize X as well. But this, of course, cannot happen because, okay, I stabilize these ones, but then I take a generator which moves around this cycle, so it moves around this X as well. It moves to a neighboring point. So it cannot stabilize it. Okay. So this is this is relatively uh, straightforward. Okay. What about the other thing that that whenever you have a non-trivial polymorphism, uh, then then you you have this compactness result. And uh, yeah, so let's let's just focus on linear equations because the story goes actually as follows. We wanted to solve linear equations because that seemed to be a solvable thing. And we just wrote down what do you need in the general context. And then we looked at the literature and it was there. So this sort of the in, in computational complexity, you would see that, but this sort of showed at least convinced me that there is like a deeper connection here cannot be accidental okay uh, so but let's let's just show for linear equation so what do we have to show that if I have a linear okay so here is the hereditary symmetric model and I have a linear equation over here which is finitarily solvable and I want to solve it okay so this is the compactness theorem here uh, now it's finitarily solvable so there is a solution outside so there is some x zero which is outside the model. In ZFC, of course, there is a solution because in ZFC compactness holds. Okay? But this has no reason to be inside the hereditary. It, it has no reason to be symmetric. And now there is this deep observation, this triviality, which makes the whole thing work. So I want this to make to be symmetric with respect to the group action. So what do I do? Well, I look at some gamma, say generator, say maybe this is going to be the, the one which permutes the first triangle. So assume that this its order is, is one. Okay. Then how do I make invariant this x0 under this gamma? Well, the trick is that I do x0, I do gamma times x0, and I do gamma square times x0, and I add this up. 
okay? This is going to be x1. And the magic is that, uh, first of all, x1 is going to have the property that x1 is invariant under this gamma, right? Because gamma has order 3. And moreover, x1 is going to be still a solution of this axb because a is invariant. Right, so it is true that gamma is A and gamma B is B because you know it's it's in the hereditary symmetric model. So it will have the property that uh, a a gamma x one equal a, a x one equals B. So x one is also a solution. So suddenly, what we managed to do is that we took any solution which is outside, not symmetric. And with, trick, with this trick that solutions can be combined to new solutions, uh, we managed to make it invariant under at least a single uh, generator. But since this group is a billion, you can do it for all generators. So basically, uh, you're done. You're done that, that we, using this trick, there is, there is a solution inside. Okay. And now you can ask, okay, this is, again, this is the very special case of linear equations. How do you do it in general? And the answer is that you look up the literature and you re and you remember that this star condition uh, also equivalent to the existence of cyclic polymorphisms. It meaning that for every prime you have you can there is this way of combining solutions to new solutions uh, in in such a manner such that if you uh, permute them cyclically you get the same result. And uh, yeah, and then you just notice that if you have a, a generator which has order p, and uh, and uh, you look this at this polymorphism, you plug in x gamma x gamma p inverse of x, then this is going to be this makes you from any solution an invariant solution. So so you can literally do the same and get that in this model with all these cycles. Uh, um, all for all h uh, k sub h holds where there is a polymorphism. Okay, uh, so yeah, so I think I'm out of time. So this is uh, what I wanted to say. Great, right. thanks, Zoltan. <laughs> all right, are there any questions? Any questions from Udine? I have I have just a one one curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. You you mentioned so the the work by Hell and Nachetril, and uh, then the conjecture by Vardy and I don't remember who. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which, which one came first? The yeah, Hell and Nachetril was first. Okay. But uh, this is this is a bit of cheating because. Uh, I mean cheating, so it's it's okay. But but Schaefer already proved uh, that conjecture, which was not stated as a conjecture, uh, thirty years before that or twenty years before that, um, for structures which has size at most two. Ah, okay. So if if a structure has a size at most two, which is you know a particular instance, he actually analyzed all the possibilities. There are not too many, um, essentially. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there so are there any other questions? All right, if not, then let's thank Sultan again.